So welcome to the second part of the attractor dynamics approach lecture. So this will be about what I will describe, explain now, sub-symbolic, I'll explain which sense it's sub-symbolic. So the last week we looked at attractor dynamics for heading direction uh, that fulfills these two constraints. This was our example of behavioral dynamics, right? The constraints of going to a target and the heading direction was this dynamical variable would have an attractor at the target value and have um, a repeller at the obstacle uh, value, value being you know, the, the bearing under which an obstacle is uh, seen. And so we discussed how the dynamics can imp impose these constraints. And, and I, I characterized that briefly as symbolic in the sense that um, for every obstacle and every target, we would have a, a contribution to the equation. So if you implement that on a robot, you would simulate that equation, uh, numerically solve the equation, and you would have to define these various forcelets, these contributions to the dynamics. And that would mean that you have uh, these parameters where targets and obstacles uh, lie in terms of angular space and maybe their strengths, the strength of repulsion or attraction. Um, and so you would, those were sort of objects, right? Countable things, which would require that you have some perceptual system that extracts these parameters from objects in the world, and which is not actually necessarily an easy thing to do. And so, uh, so symbolic in that sense, right? That you're discrete different instances of these classes target and obstacle would have to be created and then corresponding forces be generated and put into a uh, program and in fact, the example i showed you last week actually does that and so you can ask yourself do you actually need that um, for targets one could argue one does need that in the sense that the targets as we define them here are, um, are objects that are different from the background. So you would have to segment somehow the visual environment as being target versus non-target and then really estimate something about the target. Um, that is actually not always the case. There are ways of how navigation works where there is no perceptual object that defines the target. So for instance, in some approaches uh, for vehicle navigating, uh, you define the target location simply as the location in, in, in which you have a certain environment around yourself, for instance, a certain surround view. And there's nothing, no special object in that environment that characterizes the target. It's just having that view. Um, that's actually uh, hypothesized to be how animals navigate a lot of times, that they navigate until they have a familiar surrounding. And if you move a little bit, the visual surround changes. And so the visual surround does actually provide uh, localization information. Uh, so it's not as a matter of principle this way. I just want to hint at object-oriented action requires that kind of perception where you select from the visual surround an object. Uh, something that I'm very interested in in the winter semester I teach, talk about visual search and object-oriented cognition and so on. So in cases like that, you actually do need in some sense to create an instance and, and if you want to call that a symbol, create a symbol. Um, in the winter semester, I'm teaching about how to use dynamic theory for that, neural fields that represent feature values and from which you could sometimes extract a feature like that. So that will be symbolic. And in the rest of the lecture, I will actually be assuming that somehow we do that for the target. For the obstacles is less obvious because uh, there isn't really anything about the behavior that requires you to segment different objects into different objects, uh, obstacles, sorry, into different objects. For instance, if there are multiple uh, little stones in your road and you don't want to drive over them, then um, you could very easily lump two stones into one uh, if, if the vehicle can drive in between those. Then for all practical purposes, that's one obstacle. So you don't really want to have a description of the world. You just want to know uh, if there is enough free space to achieve the avoidance. And uh, it's actually that concrete problem for this very low level behavior obstacle avoidance. Low level is not a very necessary behavior you have to do all the time. And it's supposed to be automatically running in parallel with anything else. They would be very desirable to have very minimal demands on perception. 
And I showed you in my introductory lecture that vacuum cleaners do obstacle avoidance. That's actually how a lot of the vacuum cleaners even get, get to explore the space by just keeping avoiding obstacles. So a, a, a sub-symbolic approach would say, can we arrange uh, with the same tools to avoid um, occupied regions of space just based on some sensors uh, the sensors that will be appropriate would be perhaps distance sensors that give you a signal when there is something close and a different signal when things are sufficiently far. And you would erect um, a repeller for every such uh, sensor. So in this example, these red points are distance sensors. And I'm assuming each covers a certain angular range that is, uh, is sensitive to any object or surface that's close within that angular range. And then uh, the idea would be that the directions in the world, so this would be the angle, so here, the angle psi obstacle, this is this angle here. That's the, you know, the angle into which this sensor is pointing in the world relative to this fixed world axis. At that location, I would be erecting a repeller and the re repeller would be strong if the, you know, the, the surface is detected close to the vehicle. And if it's sufficiently far, I would make that strength zero. So then there would be no repeller contribution from that obstacle. That's the simple idea of this sub-symbolic approach. <clears throat> so um, you could easily think of uh, uh, extracting sensory parameters like the ra angular range and the distance as parameters that modulate these forcing functions. Here is a concrete implementation. This is old work. Actually, this quotation is wrong. This is work from Estela Bishu, many years old, and we published various different papers about it. This is from one of those. Um, so what, uh, you know, here, in this instance, we had seven such sensors. And for every sensor, the angle in which it is pointing in the world is computed from the angle on, uh, from the heading direction and the angle at which this obstacle is, uh, this sensor is mounted on the vehicle, right? They are mounted at fixed angles. So you know, this distance and, and, you know, that distance. And then adding these two, you can compute where it is in the world. So it looks like to know where the sensor is pointing in the world, you need to know your current heading of the vehicle. In a moment, you will see you don't actually need that. I'll, I'll correct that. Um, so every sensor would erect a little um, repulsive force led like that in the you know, in that direction in which it's pointing. And we'll think about the range over which we want that contribution to extend. Uh, we'll have to do with the sensor range, but also with other, other things. And we'll think about how strongly repulsive it is. We'll have to do with the distance. So here is the mathematical form uh, this can take. It's a form in which we have a linear term that will be a positive a linear function, positive slope, uh, going through zero at that direction, psi i for the sensor number i. Uh, that's the, you know, the direction in space in which it is pointing. That linear function is multiplied with a constant and we'll look at the moment, the moment that that constant depends on the distance. So it would be zero, very flat, positive curve when, the, when there's a large distance there. The range limiting factor is simply a Gaussian. And last week you investigated this in your, or you're still doing that in your exercise class to figure out how the, that works, how the range function um, as a Gaussian makes these kind of forcelets. Um, and we'll think uh, in, in a moment about how broad that Gaussian is supposed to be. Um, the first thing you want to notice here is that uh, the heading direction only shows up in that combination phi minus psi, phi minus psi, right? It doesn't show up by itself. And which, which actually phi minus psi, if we go back here, phi, this is phi and this minus psi, let's say psi minus psi plus phi is the same. That is actually the angle at which this uh, sensor is mounted. It's, you know, this angle here, this second half here, this angle, that is what phi minus psi is. And that's a constant. Uh, it's, it's for every sensor, it is uh, the angle uh, under which it is uh, mounted on the vehicle. Um, you can think about what that means for the front sensor, by the way. Think about that, you know, the sensor that's mounted exactly at the front of the vehicle. 
so this is just a constant and that's just a constant so you don't need phi that's why the phi doesn't actually need to be calibrated for this purpose it's different for the target um, so measurement actually will only enter into the strength here and to the width through a function that we still have to specify uh, it's kind of amazing that but still this thought is necessary to understand why it works but in practice you uh, only estimate this here at a fixed value. Uh, so the distance dependence is typically chosen to be exponential, so that it has a scale again. Uh, so we have a number that says how strong you want this to fall off. And then there's a prefactor that says, you know, what the overall strength is. So when this is, uh, let's say one at so distance, uh, you have certain maximum strength. Uh, and, and the idea that you want to have it fall off in strength is, of course, that you want to avoid collision. So those repulsions that come from opposites very close are supposed to have more weight, overpower any repulsions from obstacles that are further away. And of course, you have to um, downgrade the repulsive influence of an obstacle when it's far so that you can move it all. Because presumably, if you're looking around 360 degrees, there's always going to be some a surface uh, at some point. Um, so if you were to make repulsion independent of distance, then you could never move anywhere, right? So you do need that distance dependence. And that's true about the symbolic approach as well. Uh, the angular range, it turns out that the angular range has to have two components. One component is, of course, the angular range of the sensor. So if this inner sector here characterizes the area from which the sensor picks up signal. So for instance, for uh, a sonar, the, it could be the construction of that sonar of, of, uh, of a, which angular range is sensitive to uh, acoustic signals. Um, we have these light, infrared, infrared light, um, infrared light um, receptors that pick up light that's reflected from a surface. Those are actually largely influenced by how narrow the beam is of light that we send forward. And uh, laser range finders, you could figure out, you know, over which angular range they get reflections. And, and in a, if you do this based on vision, you can compute over which range, um, you know, your, the, the algorithm that you're taking to pick up obstacles uh, is sensitive. So that's the minimal width because you could have an obstacle anywhere within that sector. And so you'd have to assume the maximum obstacle would cover the entire sector. That will be your delta theta here. Uh, on the other hand, you of course also have to avoid the obstacle, really avoid collision, and that is, means it's not enough to just avoid steering inside of that sector. You also need to to keep certain safety margins so that when you are at the distance of the obstacle, your vehicle still fits. And so, what that means in angular space is that the angle subtended by the vehicle, half of it, has to be added to each side. Oops, sorry. So that's uh, uh, this computation. This is the angular sector itself. And this is uh, the arctan of that is the angular, the angles uh, subtended by the vehicle at that distance. So you're adding these two and forming the arctan and then the, you get that complete sector. You can think through that to figure it out. That's what happens. So that creates a, an interesting effect because that means that when an ob obstacle is closer, it will, um, create a larger angular range of repulsion than when it's further because uh, the vehicle the angle uh, subtended by the vehicle when it's close is larger than when it is far right when it's very far that contribution might be negligible and you're only left with uh, delta theta of course that's when you don't uh, take that term at all um, that has some functional significance i think i have a demo later where um, as you approach uh, a wall, for instance, you might get sensor readings from multiple sensors that are sensing that closer distance of the wall. They, all these contributions will become broader. When they become broader, they overlap more. You, you remember last week when, when the linear parts are overlapping, then you do this averaging, and that will mean you're creating a single repeller uh, centered in the, at the average of these sensors. So this will be good when you approach a wall uh, so that multiple sensors that are neighbors will tend to um, fuse, creating a single rep broad single rep repeller from that wall. So, so it will function feature. I'll, I'll show you examples like that in a moment. Um, 
So uh, the idea of, of using subsymmetric angle approach is that you're again sort of superposing the contributions of all the different sensors. Uh, so you, in the case of the seven sensors, you would be adding up the seven sensors um, and, and get repelled from there. Actually, again, if you think about it, one of those sensors never contributes. Uh, think about the sensor four, does it ever contribute? So it's actually really six drums that matter. Um, here's an, uh, so, so here's an example where these two are activated and, and they are somewhat parallel, so they create an average um, repeller in between. So you're not uh, restricted to only avoiding directions that are sampled by these sensors. You can do averaging between two neighboring sensors if both of them sense something small. So here, let's say these, these two sensors, right? Both sense that this obstacle and you are repelled effectively from something in the middle, which would be something, you know, sampling that obstacle fairly. So, um, the first thing you could worry is uh, why this works. If you're a dynamicist, you could immediately see that there's a little bit of a problem with this. Um, you could wonder if the, repuls the repulsive force sets like that are, are sufficiently invariant. And uh, just imagine that you're, you know, each, you know, I'm saying each sensor repels from the direction in which it's pointing. If you rotate the vehicle on the spot, the dynamics supposed to be invariant. We said that previously, yeah? the angle at which the obstacle is uh, detected doesn't depend on the vehicle uh, location. Um, and, and that's a prerequisite for that to be a well-defined dynamic. Because after all, if I, if I define this dynamic here, I want to, at every value of that function to read off the rate of change. Uh, so I cannot have that this function moves when I rotate, because then the uh, values of that function no longer determine my uh, turning rate. And it's some, you know, some, some not obvious function of how this function depends on, on turning, on, on my uh, heading direction that will determine the turning rate. So it's not really the dynamical function. So what we have to make sure is that when the vehicle rotates on the spot, this repulsive function be, stays the same stays invariant. That will not be true about these individual forcelets, right? Because if I rotate, the forcelet rotates. It looks at different directions in the world, so it will move. And so I'm de demonstrating here that approximately it's true, and I'm doing this by comparing uh, two different situations. Let's say I have the vehicle rotate in this direction. Here's an obstacle. The data actually in this example are uh, data that Estella obtained from actual sensors. And it's only actually approximately true, what I was show you. So uh, in this case, uh, sensor number five and number six sense the obstacle. Uh, here, these two, and that's the situ situation we're just looking at. And they um, make a repeller here uh, somewhere between five and six, so pretty much exactly toward the obstacle. That's the where the repeller lies. I put in this red mark to say that's the function that you're sampling when you're at this heading direction. So this is where the heading direction is. So this is the value that you will be reading from your, uh, for your heading direction. That's the value you send down to the wheels as a turning rate of the vehicle. Now let's assume that we rotated the vehicle on the spot to point in this blue direction, which is uh, here. Again, this is a, here actually I have to use the real convention. So it is at larger, heading and larger angles go to the left, right? So I move to the right in this graph and to the left in this graph, which is mathematically correct. Here, here, here this trick I've been using so far doesn't really work. I have to follow the actual mathematical convention. So you see when the vehicle is oriented this way, sensor number three, uh, four, three, and two are hitting the obstacle with different uh, distances, a little bit longer here for the outer sensors than the center sensors. So you have three contributions. The center one and three has the largest uh, forcelet and the two and one have a little bit less large forcelet. So these three curves are different than the previous curve. But if you look at the black curve, it is actually quite similar uh, here. I, allow you to make that contrast directly. See the black curve here on top and the bottom are very similar. The, the uh, uh, repeller is here at psi three, which is pretty much directly orthogonal here in the direction of the obstacle, just as it was before, sort of between, yeah, between these two, pretty much 90 degrees toward the obstacle. 
So the blue curve, the, the dark curve is invariant under that transformation. And so that is an empirical fact when it depends on having uh, modeled the sensor sensitivity, uh, uh, range of sensitivity correctly with these uh, Gaussian uh, curves, it's actually not going to be perfect in, uh, in practice um, because these sensor characteristics are not exactly like that. Um, and because these sensors actually are not really calibrated. If you get a sensor with a certain range and there's an obstacle that is only in part of the range, you get a little bit more um, a little bit less reflected light, and that suggests a larger distance than there's actually physically. So they are not perfectly invariant, but approximately, and so it's good enough. It actually does qualitatively do the right thing. And this actually, in practice, works without much calibration very well. And that's the reason why it works. Yeah. So um, that was obstacle avoidance. Now for target acquisition, we're still doing the same thing. The target we treat as being symbolic you know, that we know there's one contribution at a particular target angle, nothing changed here. And so we have the same thing we did before and that will then, you know, the target is always weaker. So in this case, for instance, the attraction to the target is overpowered by the two obstacles that overall make this black curve, which has a repeller at the target direction and set has a attractor here somewhere to the right. And this, so this one corresponds to turning around the vehicle on the left, this one, corresponds to turning around the vehicle on the right, which is so very really far here in this case. So I want to show you now a couple of examples. This is from the real vehicle. So what Ishela did then, back then, she uh, had the vehicle and these obstacles were actually card, white cardboards. I'll show you a video in, in a little while where you see, actually, why don't I even show you here? It's this thing here, this vehicle. And these are these uh, white boxes she used as ideal obstacles. This vehicle has uh, these infrared light uh, sensors and uh, emitters. So it, it measures the infrared light reflected from a surface like that. White surfaces reflect very well. So these were the ideal obstacles. So we're, we're looking at um, data from that vehicle, but here analyzed so to sort of understand really what happens. So here, here's an example uh, where um, Stella had um, these two boxes and she varied the opening between the two boxes. Uh, there was always a target program to be ahead so that the system would actually try to push through that. You really see the quality of obstacle avoidance only if you have some uh, force that pushes against it. And um, so <clears throat> there are only, under this configuration, there are only uh, two obstacles that um, sensors really are, are detecting sensor number one and number six, which uh, sensor number six, I think, has the repulsive uh, force that's here, number two has it here, and the uh, solid line is there some, and it also has a contribution from the attraction. So you see it has, under these conditions, there is actually an attractor in between these two uh, directions because the vehicle could still move through Oh, these are actually only the contributions of the obstacle avoidance, and, and this is where the target uh, term is added in, which is this dotted line. And so that converges with this uh, attractor between these two sensors, and you see, therefore, you have an attractor here at this location. Um, when we push these closer, then it's actually four sensors that pick up something here. The four contributions of varying strengths, number five, uh, is pretty strong, number three is pretty strong, uh, because these distances are a little shorter than the distances toward six and two. Uh, so you have a, a nice uh, repeller of all these attractor uh, repulsive forces that the attraction force cannot overcome, and that's the example I showed initially. You have a single repeller here, and the only attractor is sort of in the back backside. You have to move away from this opening to, to get that right. And um, if you systematically vary the distance between these obstacles, you can track out the um, stable states, which are these uh, circles with the, uh, co connected by a fat line, and then the rep uh, repeller states, which are these little squares. And you see actually very nice, I mean, it's discrete sampling, the pitchfork bifurcation here, where uh, as the distance between these obstacles um, uh, increases, you have um, a, uh, did I do this wrong? You have a single attractor 
yeah, if, the, if they're far enough from each other, you have a single attractor that allows you to move in between and uh, at shorter distances, this attractor splits into two attractors that mean going around the obstacle and in the middle you're left with a repeller. There's also uh, always a repeller in the backside. That is, if you move opposite to the, to the target, that is a repeller, right? That's the decision point where you decide whether you go to the target around the left or around the right. So uh, this um, video shows uh, an implementation of that. So the target is this cross. It was uh, given to the vehicle just by that reckoning by tank at the coordinate and the estimate vehicle estimating its coordinate. And uh, you see that on the first try, it's, uh, if, there's no opening here. It navigates around that. It doesn't have a global plan. So it you know, opportunistically tries to move toward the target. And at some point it uh, then actually has to another, make another avoidance uh, movement. Now it's a little bit open, but it's still not enough. And you see it will turn away. You see, it has no idea about the layout. So it moves in some other direction. I think Pierre Malet, who engineer who designed all this, intervenes so it doesn't move too far away. And it will find the target again only by trying time and again to turn in that direction. and then ultimately do that. So this part actually isn't so important. It's just we recorded that. And then in a moment, you'll see that we try this again, uh, starting with the uh, opening that's sufficient and the robot will be uh, oscillating a little bit as it sometimes fails to see the one on the left and then it actually moves through. And you saw that it also becomes slower as it moves through that. And that is something I didn't explain. We actually also control the speed of the robot to be smaller when short distances are sensed, because then we know that the uh, rate at which these um, effectively these repellers move around in angular space increases when something's very close, it changes angular bearing very quickly. And therefore, to be able to uh, follow the attractor that moves, uh, we need to go slow. <clears throat> OK. Um, here is this example that I uh, hinted at initially, that uh, a vehicle is approaching a wall. Uh, the target is behind that wall, and that will make the uh, you know, vehicle um, you know, push it into the wall. And um, I, show you how bifurcation happens there. That is initially, as you're heading to the target, the wall is still far enough away for no force led to ever to pick up any distance. These sensors are very short, short range. They don't really detect stuff that's very far. It's about one vehicle size, a little bit more than that uh, of distance that they uh, are sensitive to. So here you see the dynamics is headed, uh, uh, um, dominated entirely by the target acquisition force that, that goes in this direction. Now, as you're approaching, you see it's a little bit closer, uh, a obstacle force that is coming up. There is a sensor here in the center, um, I think, I'm not sure, that has a little bit of force. That, that force that actually has no effect on the heading, as you can think through uh, in a moment. Um, and we uh, still have an attractor here at the target, so it will be still moving closer. And then uh, three sensors pick up something. The three sensors now uh, create, um, see the, the three curves here, and they create overall a repeller here, which at this point is already making the, the, the full solid line is the total force. It already has a positive slope. So there is already an attractor here at this point. Uh, the dotted line is the attraction to the target. The dashed line is the sum of all the obstacle contributions. They overall make a repeller, but the system is still heading in this direction because it is, that's how it was driving. So it needs to now escape from that repeller, which will be happening at the next moment in time. And um, uh, did I, uh, oh no, no, I actually didn't plot that, uh, that next moment in time. I, so there's, it actually does go around it. So it does find its way around. Uh, what I've uh, instead shown here is when you do the same when the opening uh, is a little opening and uh, you will see that it's the same sort of thing happens. It's just uh, 
barely uh, repulsive, very, very flat here. So it takes a little longer to get around that. And then when there is a full opening, then you see that now there is this little, little attractor left. And you see that the, the, this, this contribution from the sensor and that contribution only two. And um, they will make a, allow for a little attractor in the middle between these two locations. And uh, remember last time with the symbolic approach, I explained how you can actually move when you're always sitting in a tractor in this particular dramatic example where uh, the, system, the robot is close to a obstacle and therefore at short distance, you know, the angles shift quite strongly as the vehicle moves and we'll be, uh, we'll be able to track between these two how the vehicle sit sitting in a tractor actually moves. So here in this instance, three sensors sense these obstacles. These three uh, pointers here indicate that. Uh, these are the three obstacle contributions. They lead to the dashed line as the sum. So the sum is actually a single repeller here in uh, a direction that's a little bit to the right of where the vehicle is currently, uh, where the truck is, is located. And, um, and you see overall there's a repeller now at that direction and the vehicle will have to go to a, a tractor. Actually, it, it will be a little bit to the left. It will be going around uh, smaller headings uh, in the next moment. And as it does that, it, um, at this location, it's only one sensor here. This sensor that senses a close by repulsion has a repeller here in this direction. And um, it now has two attractors. One is going around in uh, uh, a small, this would be sort of going, I think in this direction, oops, sorry. And then it has another repeller here, attractor here that is going, uh, would be going actually in the opposite direction. And it is in this attractor and is you know, continuing to the, to the uh, target. I'll show you in a moment uh, how, uh, as a time series, these different attractors. Oops. And um, this is the same when the opening is a little bit larger. Um, the vehicle, you know, it's actually, there's always an attractor in the middle. You see here is an attractor in the middle. So in this case, you can really be sitting in the attractor. And uh, the, this is a, uh, the, the plot I promised where now we're looking at a time series of these different retractors in the palace. The solid line here is, the heading direction that was actually realized by the uh, vehicle. And then you have the cross and the open circles are two attractors. Um, and there is sometimes another attractor out here um, and also occurs here sometimes. Uh, so a uh, attractor that's far, the separate kind of attractor. And so what you're seeing is that as the vehicle approaches the surface, uh, the, the obstacle, um, the single attractor that it has in the direction of the target splits in a, in a pitchfork bifurcation into two attractors going around one and going around the other. The vehicle follows this bottom one. Um, you don't see the repeller that's in the middle because this we just numerically computed the uh, attractors and the repeller isn't relevant directly. You could also compute that, I guess. Uh, and what you see here is that the vehicle doesn't immediately follow the attractor. It takes some time to relax the attractor that's escaping from that um, repeller here in the middle. After some time, it has escaped that and then it tracks the attractor pretty well, sorry, pretty well. And that's for some other condition. This is the kind of example when it just goes through, see there's a little bit of a wiggle because it occasionally gets a little bit of an obstacle influence. That's why there is this little rotation as it goes through the opening. So here's some, some other simulation exa uh, uh, implementation examples. The target is out here and this vehicle just makes this turn because of the obstacles, right? It doesn't know anything about the world. It's just uh, doing its job of going to the target. It, it's positioned, ending up here is a question of how well it does the dead reckoning, which depends on the surface, the you know, just slip and so on. So it's not always perfect. Here this shows the Opposite, so it, the target is here, it starts from there. And um, again, does it find the opening? Um, 
it, you will see it does, and it does it essentially just by virtue of the environment. So it's always trying to turn in this direction, but it's being prevented by the obstacle. So for instance, here the obstacle ends and therefore it tries to turn toward the target. And again, it keeps trying to turn to the target. And because suddenly there's no more repulsion here, it finds its way. Keyboard again is just lying on top of that. That isn't part of the model. Now, perfectly finds its way in there. So even though this is a purely local approach, doesn't have any information about, um, about uh, you know, the layout of the world, doesn't have a map, it uh, will do better than you might think because of the structure of the environment, because there are walls and the walls essentially give you a continuous line of obstacles that can direct your path to an opening when that repulsion falls away. Here's a, another instance where we just put up another obstacle and now this vehicle finds the other path, uh, again, just by virtue of the environment. You know, imagine just always trying to turn here. I'll show you a little later that this is actually good for indoors navigation because indoors is pretty much like that. There are walls and then their openings are called doors. And so this system will find its way through doors that way. Now the dead reckoning wasn't perfect. Yeah, so that's a point I'm making. So uh, Pierre Mallet, who designed that piece of hardware in Marseille, uh, uh, leveraged that idea to say, I could, could I, oh, can I make a, a wheelchair uh, operate in indoors environments uh, based on such low level sensors? So what he did is, he equipped that uh, wheelchair with a lot of uh, sensors like that. All of these little knobs are sensors like that. We bought like a, a thousand. These, these things are extremely cheap, but you can only buy like a thousand at a time. And they're little light emitting uh, diodes um, that you know emit infrared light. Uh, you put a little plastic rubber piece around it to focus the light. And then uh, infrared light receptors, little resistors, that are, can be combined. And he actually built a little sensor that combines five of these emitters with a receptor and mounted them along the vehicle. I think there were like a hundred of those here on the vehicle at different positions, all these different knobs. And they were fed through an you know, analog uh, digital class and a card into a, a laptop that was mounted on the vehicle. This wouldn't necessarily be the actual use of course of the wheelchair in practice. Uh, you know, an autonomous wheelchair is useful to patients who cannot use the joystick. If you can use the joystick, you'll use the joystick. That's fun. And you are feeling in control. Uh, so this is relevant for people who can't do that. Sometimes people with um, muscular, for instance, a lot of co-contractions, so they, they cannot smoothly control uh, their, their hand or other, other uh, diseases like that. And the idea would be that people like that can give targets to the robot intermittently by different interfaces you have to build for individuals, but they can't continuously control. And so intermittently could mean like every couple of meters or every 10 meters, for instance. And so the autonomy would be just to get from one point to the next in that kind of setting. And current technology is always that you need a lot of infrastructure like a map and the system really can totally uh, work totally autonomously. Well, we thought this would be something still reactive where the user can tell the system which room to go to. We actually had an interface where there's a map of the apartment on the computer, but it's not something the robot knows to localize itself. And it's just that the user can then from that select an angle that uh, you're currently steering at and then um, uh, that will be the target value. And the obstacle button is done by these sensors. And so here's uh, and just the, the way it's calibrated is that you arrange for it to avoid obstacles correctly. Here's a close one and another one. And so when, once you've, it's more complicated with a vehicle, you see, you have to be sure that it, it's not a, a robot that can turn on the spot in the same way. So it's a little more complex to get all of that calibrated. And this actually worked surprisingly well. I, I show you here in parallel two videos of this wheelchair uh, moving around the corridors of the lab in Marseille. This was the one room that was a bit empty for testing it out, but you see it's venturing out into the corridor. Uh, 
and it uh, it's always these are the critical things. You know, does it actually cut corners? And you have to make sure you tune everything correctly for that. And you see some oscillations that happen when the sensor on the left um, repel, repels, and there is no signal from the sensor on the right. So there are certain distances from walls that are good for the for that system, and um, it does navigate. Now, this was, of course, just a demonstration, and we tried to get further. We got a little ground for that, but we didn't make it to product level, and that was largely caused by difficulties with the business model. Who would pay for this? The health insurance, very small patient population, very specialized. And, uh, you know, is this something, how does this improve their quality of life? Well, if they are in one of those homes that many of these people live in, where they are sitting in the wheelchair for hours and nobody moves them, this can be uh, something they, they, they are interested in. Uh, because this is just giving them mobility to move a few meters. And this just shows the user interface. So it's, very, it's just a research project. Yeah, we did try that out with patients in a clinic, a rehab clinic. The patients really loved it. They, it was a, more like a, a game thing that they could move a little but usually they always rely on someone moving them around on the wheelchair. Good, and uh, another implementation we'll discuss in an exercise. Estrela Bishu uh, built a whole fleet of little robots that use this basic technology and showed how they can cooperate. It's very interesting. Okay, so this is the first part of my lecture in which I show you how the attract Dynamics works uh, with these low level sensors. Um, and I'll now show you, so, uh, the key element of this was, right, that the forcelets together create a dynamics that has the invariance that you need. That is, the dynamics really describes the change of heading as a function of the different orientation angles. That's the critical thing to work right. I'll show you something much more radical now, where that same principle applies to one derivative higher, namely the rate of change. And so what you have to have is that the rate of change is a dynamic variable and its change, which is acceleration, is a well-defined function of the rate of change and that's invariant under a relevant transformation that I'll show you. So this is something we also did at, at about the same time, also in Marseille, uh, the vehicle was even more radically simple. It is actually what is now called the Lego uh, robot, uh, or Lego uh, called Mindstorm, I think. It's something you can buy it's based on a board that's on here that at the time was used at, uh, at the MIT in their graduate classes, a robot class. It was a very simple processor, 8-bit uh, processor, sort of like, like the, I would say Coca-Cola machine. So it's like, like uh, today every little device has, has a processor like that in there. Very limited, had about 128 lines of code, I believe. And uh, these MIT folks who developed this as a lab class developed a language called Interactive C, with which you could pro program that uh, microcontroller. Uh, so that's the electronic core of it. And uh, the, the, the same chip and this Interactive C in some nicer form is now made available by Lego as a tool, toy for children, uh, where you also can build the vehicle uh, from. Lego uh, pieces. We actually had a few pieces of Lego. You see here, this is actually Lego. The rest is wood. These are these uh, light emitting uh, um, diodes. So, so this is a light emitting diode. And this is this little rubber tube on top. And this is the detector of the light. So we had five of those here pointing in different directions. There were two motors here uh, under, under the vehicle. They were actually from toy planes, you get these servo motors for their rudders of toy planes. And we just cut the servo part and just use them uh, as, in, you know, in a way as uncalibrated velocity servo. So it's not even servo, so velocity generates some kind of immersion velocity. Uh, these are the just batteries here in the back and you know, all kind of very smooth uh, cabling. Now for target acquisition, we had two light dependent resistors. So this and that are two resistors whose um, uh, you know, resistance depends on light. It's, it's a 
part you can buy anywhere. Um, and so we used uh, this uh, board to transform these into digital signals. So we had seven signals, five uh, intensities from these distance sensors and two uh, intensities or two voltages from these resistors here. And um, nothing is calibrated here. That is, we don't know what level of light, we don't really know what level of distance, and these motors are not well calibrated. <clears throat> so, um, the, so you can't really determine from this the direction in which a light source lies, right? And it's just like a two pixel camera. And from these two pixels, you cannot estimate where a light source lies, uh, which would be uh, somehow you know, interpolating between these two light intensities. And so we thought the simple idea was that we would be steering in the direction where there is more light. So if there's more light on the left, we would steer left and more light on the right, we would steer right. It's sort of like a Breitenberg vehicle. And for the uh, obstacles, we can do the same thing as we did before. That is the closer the um, uh, distance that's estimated, the stronger repeller in that direction. And as I showed you before, we don't really need the heading direction of the vehicle to impose that uh, form of um, repulsion. Uh, so the fact that we don't have that very well calibrated doesn't really matter. It's just got to be approximately right. And um, we don't have to estimate the heading. And we could implement that straightforward. Now, this the idea of uh, avoiding, uh, of moving in the direction in which there's more light, that is not something that you can easily express in terms of um, desired heading. It's, it's actually a desired turning rate. It says when you're small light on the left, you want to turn left. If there's more right, light on the right, you want to turn right. So what we actually did is we introduced as a new behavior variable, omega dot, uh, you know, omega, sorry, the, the uh, turning rate itself, we call that omega, rather than the heading direction. So there's so a one derivative higher. You can certainly uh, do that. You can create uh, a signal that impose, imposes that on the motors, but just you know, send, you know, looking at the rate of change, you can create um, set points for these velocity servos that are uh, consistent with that turning change of turning rate. Um, and and so what we had to do is come up with a dynamics at the level of omega that would implement that attraction to prefer turning rates, and we would have to take the obstacle dynamics and lift it to the level of turning rate. Uh, so with the logic that, you know, if an obstacle is to the right and close, you want to turn left. If it's an obstacle to the left and close, you want to turn right. And if there is nothing, then you want to just keep your, um, you have no influence on the turning rate. So uh, here is uh, how we did the obstacle avoidance. Uh, so this omega is your dynamical variable. Um, and uh, I have here uh, pitchfork bifurcation, right? Uh, I think you, you didn't exercise that, but I showed that in the lecture. Instead of omega, we had an x then, and x dot was equal to linear x plus x to the third. That's the pitchfork bifurcation normal form. Uh, so it will have that property that it will either have an attractor at zero or it will have an attractor at plus minus one, depending on the sign of alpha. We don't have only that, we also have here a bias term. So that will either be positive or negative and we'll, we'll determine whether we turn uh, to the right or to the left um, uh, around the obstacle. And, uh, and that will be based on, on knowing on which side of the obstacle we are. Uh, so here's um, the different dynamical regimes that we would be having. Uh, so when, um, when this term is zero, we let's say we uh, have an obstacle right ahead or we have no obstacle, then this will go from having a single attractor at a zero turning rate, that will be alpha negative. Again, this term is zero, alpha negative here. Um, then this here is essentially just a mildly uh, nonlinear uh, attractor term that has, has zero turning, that is going straight. Now you don't know, need to know where you're going. You just say, well, I'm going, I'm going straight. Well, uh, if this becomes positive, then you have that pitchfork bifurcation. This becomes a repeller. And then you have two attractors. This would be 
uh, increasing turning rate to turn left, actually. In reality, it's the other way around, turning right. And this one is turning left. Uh, and that's the property of the normal form. Now, this bias term makes that we can either arrange for the turning to the left or for the turning, you know, actually, I've only plotted this one, for the turning to the left to be the predominant solution. So if I make it, if it shifts the whole thing up, then I will only have this attractor turning to the left, turns out to be this positive value. And if I do the opposite, I shift everything down. So this is negative sign. It will be the turning in the other direction. That's the only solution. And so that's what would be happening if the obstacle is on the right, then we would emphasize that solution that is avoiding it to the left. Uh, and so so the, the uses of these terms are you know, no obstacle would be this, an obstacle right ahead would be that, and then an obstacle to the right would be this, an obstacle to the left would be the same in the opposite direction. And, um, <clears throat> Before I go there, maybe let, let me illustrate this, uh, this thing here is, so for instance, if you are um, um, confronting an obstacle, there are these different ranges. So you, the, uh, if the obstacle is right ahead, you would have this repulsion from that turning weight if the obstacle is close and you would have an attraction if, there is no, if it's far. Now, if you're in this part of the obstacle, so you are, um, you're actually, uh, you can hear I switched, I think you're on the right of the obstacle, or the, the uh, no, you're on the left of the obstacles. The obstacle's here and you're on the, is it to the right? Or, oh, larger angle here to the left of the obstacle. You would have this dynamics lifted up where your attraction is going around the left at that positive turning rate. And if you're on this, uh, in this range, so the obstacles to your right, you would have the opposite. So you're turning to the left to avoid the obstacle on the correct side. And if you're outside of this, so the obstacle is far from your current heading, then uh, you, you will go again with this having just a zero crossing. That's sort of the logic. And uh, mathematically, what happens is that we take the um, avoidance force let. This is what you're familiar with. It's written down here again. It's the force let to avoid an obstacle in this heading direction. Uh, again, with this uh, distance dependence of the lambda, and this is the width factor here, that's the same thing I just discussed. And to lift this one level higher, you know, meaning lifting it in here, we just need to create these, uh, compute these three uh, parameters. We need, this is constant. This is the parameter that decides between attraction and repulsion. We need to compute that from this here. And then it turns out that we can actually construct this here. So alpha is computed by just integrating this across heading, which gives us this function. Now, if you see the reverse, if you uh, differentiate this, you get the force, right? It has, uh, uh, actually it's minus this. Uh, so here it's increasing and that means minus this is negative. And here it's decreasing, so minus this is positive. So, so the force is minus the derivative of the potential, like in physics, right? The force is the uh, gradient, negative gradient of the potential. So this potential is obtained by integrating across this. And what we're, you remember the, the uh, strength of the repulsion, you know, how, how articulate this is, if, uh, is a question of the distance. So if I make it, the distance is uh, large and this is a flat curve, and then this will be not very elevated. So as the distance of the obstacle uh, becomes shorter, this becomes a more articulated peak. The high peak means it's a steep gradient. Now it makes the derivatives high. And, um, and this, so the alpha is really just computed by essentially a sigmoid on this. We are taking only the positive part and making the positive part sort of normalizing it. We use an arctan as a sigmoid, you know, just in historical reasons why we did it that way. So uh, where this is positive, it will uh, make it more steeply positive. So it values, it goes actually from zero to pi half, uh, so 1.57 is pi half. That's why this pi half shows up here, is the amplitude of that sigma. It's not from zero to one, but from zero to pi half. Uh, in the opposite direction, it has a negative value. This is a sigma that goes from minus pi half to plus pi half. And we actually use that fact. Uh, so uh, you can see that. Uh, by comparing where our alpha is uh, lifted to pi half, we can say that when we are in the range of the obstacle, uh, 
this will be non-zero. You know, when, when we're at minus pi half, uh, it will be zero. So down here, we will have zero. So that's where we'll be neutral. There will be no term. And as, so, as long as we are in the repulsive term, there is some amplitude here. This is a constant. So this is a range indicator, whether we're sensitive, whether in the range where an obstacle is detected. And we're multiplying this with the f-ops. The f-ops is you know, this function here. And that's how we can get the sign. So when, it's, when we're here, we lift it up. When we're here, we shift it down. And so that's how, how we decide whether this goes up or down. And so that's all. Now we're, we're obtaining the alpha from this force that by integration uh, with you know, going through here, and then it goes into this uh, arctan. And then we're using the sign of this function here to control whether the shift goes up or down. So, so that's, uh, that's for obstacles. It's kind of amazing. It means that when you're navigating around the world and there's an obstacle somewhere, you're approaching an obstacle, then um, what you, now it's your turning rate that's always an attractor. So your turning rate was, let's say, in the attractor of zero uh, turning rate. Uh, so you were driving straight and now you're hitting an obstacle, depending on where you're hitting it, the dynamics changes into this sort of thing. And as you're turning, it is changing again, because as you're turning, you know, these different things uh, change. So you're seeing this attractor for a while, and then maybe you have turned away. So the obstacle now falls outside of this and the dynamics will return to that. And then you go straight in the direction there, right? So it's here, the, the bifurcation happens as you're turning at a constant turning rate, um, bifurcation happens. Kind of mind boggling. <laughs> The uh, target position is much simpler, so there are many ways to do that. The simple form is to say, I just have an attraction to a positive turning rate for one sensor and a negative turning rate for the other, sorry, the other way around. And uh, all I do is I modulate these attractions with the measured light intensity. So what we did is actually we shifted these dynamics left, right. So we shifted the attractor a little bit with the light intensity, but one could also do that in other ways. And the result was that when the two lights have the same intensity, the attractor is at zero, you're going straight. And uh, the, when, when the uh, more intense light is on the right, then you would have a, a turning rate actually, uh, so it, it was on the left, you would have a turning rate at positive value. So you would be turning to the left toward that light source. In closed loop, that will orient you to the light source. So, there, there was a range limitation for that. And other than that, you just added these two contributions and all of this, uh, we call this thing Rodinsky, all of this just integrated on the system. This is the microcontroller. I pretty much said everything about that and it worked. And this is just some path traced. And here's a movie that shows that. Uh, these, uh, you have to have pretty dark uh, ambient lights for this to work. These two light sources are pretty, Right, so here it doesn't sense any light and the distance sensors make it turn. So it just goes around based on obstacle avoidance, doesn't know anything about. This is actually Estelle Akish who <laughs> did that in her doctor thesis. She controls these light sources. So in a moment she will be turning on some of these light sources. They are pretty bright, you see, and that helps the speaker. So just doing obstacle avoidance following these obstacle parkour that was erected. It was actually a vehicle that was able to move pretty fast because the computation was so simple. We didn't have to take uh, care of that. So here it turns you know, to the light source. We also control the speed. Again, I didn't explain. So it stopped when it was in front of intense light. And now she actually is playing with that because when she switches the light source, uh, you know, when, when she turns off, the vehicle can drive again. It's a little oscillating here. Uh, at this level of ambient light, these light sensors don't really sense anything. And so it's just, just, just obstacle avoidance and you know, immediately there will actually be the obstacle that turns it around and goes there again. So it really does phono Texas, right? Uh, not phono, it's, it's a light attra attraction to light. We later built a uh, real sound source seeker and in the winter semester, I showed that to some of you. Yeah, so this is certainly, this was, uh, we once were at a robotic workshop uh, in uh, Italy. Uh, so it was actually in the Italian part of Switzerland. And um, 
And this robot was actually the only low level robot that didn't get stuck because it, it's mechanisms that it's because higher level always moves. There's no, no way it gets up except for this, you know, uh, the controlling the speed. But in terms of angle, it's you know, very nice, right? Good. Uh, <clears throat> so the analogous issue you have to analyze is uh, does the dynamics have the right invariance? And so here it's, it's you know, as heading, as the speed changes, the dynamics remains invariant. Um, but uh, as heading changes, now when, 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 when the speed changes, uh, of course, heading changes. And when heading changes, which, you know, a priori heading could change at an arbitrarily different time scale because, uh, you know, it's just a question of the size of your speed, right? If you, if you take a, a, the attractor to be a small rotation speed, then the heading changes very slowly. Now we, we played with that how strongly we could, how fast we could turn and, and erect, uh, erected these attractors at the right uh, level of speed. So a priori, the, the um, speed at which these attractors lie is a free parameter. And you can make it such that they lie at speeds at which the heading changes relatively slowly. And as the heading changes, the attractor landscape changes. So you will be sitting in a tractor for turning rate for your angular turning rate. And at, as your heading as a result changes relative to the world, at some point the attractor will change. You'll switch to another attractor and then your know, turning rate will change a different way. That's how it works. Uh, so it's again, the same logic that you're always sitting in the attractor, but now even one level higher, you can make a very agile kind of system. And in fact, we demonstrated that it has its advantages. We don't need to read all that. You can read the slides later. Uh, this was a project that someone from, um, was it Brazil or from Colombia? I don't remember. Uh, he was from Brazil, actually, I think, yeah. Uh, he visited us and we did a little project. This is published in a little paper where we compared different approaches uh, and um, we looked at something like the uh, for instance, here, we look at the different measures. This is the temporal average of angular acceleration in a particular parkour, and we compare different approaches. And um, what was interesting to us for, for that purpose was to say, we want an approach that doesn't do so radical maneuvers all the time because these maneuvers cost energy. This was based to uh, essentially trying to get toward um, uh, drones that would be using this kind of thing. Uh, but this was done in a simulation with just vehicles. And uh, so this is the approach that I'm, I just reviewed. This is the re regular attractor dynamics approach. And these are two approaches that use potential field techniques that I'll only explain next week or in two weeks. Um, and so you see that ours really, the, the, the second order is really the sleekest, the, the one that does least turning, sort of the most elegant in a way. Because in some sense, it anticipates, it, it, it is more uh, flexible. <clears throat> While the other ones turn relatively sharp late and then they turn quite sharp. This is a particular problem with the potential field approach, but it was also a problem for the first order approach. Okay, so that uh, finish, closes these uh, lectures on the two low level uh, dynamics. So in each case, we had different behavioral variables. We created attractor states for these. Um, target acquisition as an attractive force, obstacle buttons as a repulsive force, and then the instabilities were used to make decisions turning on left, right, can I go through or not? And uh, when we do it sub-symbolically, we really have very minimal requirements for perception. Here we could just use raw sensory information, uncalibrated raw sensory information to implement these behavioral constraints. It's not an exact approach. We call it a heuristic approach. That is, there is no guarantee that it will ful fulfill the constraints. It's just a approximation of doing that. Uh, and, and so for such guarantees, for instance, you really need calibrated sensor information. Okay, and I'll close this lecture. <laughs>